Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, Uber hits the gas on its push into self-driving cars. We'll bring you all the details on the company's biggest acquisition to date and its driverless car pilot in Pittsburgh. Plus, can Apple cut its smartwatch free from the iPhone? We'll bring you a preview of what not to expect from the next generation to be released this fall. And Tencent teams up with a new innovator in Hollywood. We'll speak to STX Entertainment and TPG about their latest Asian backer. But first, to our lead. Uber users in downtown Pittsburgh will be able to summon a self-driving car, not in 10 years, not in five, but this month. Travis Kalanick's ride-hailing giant will beat Google, Tesla, and all of the biggest car makers in Detroit to a mega milestone for the auto industry, getting a self-driving ride-hailing fleet on the roads First, Uber starting with specially modified Volvo SUVs, but the deal isn't exclusive. We also know Uber bought the self-driving truck startup Auto this month for an undisclosed amount. Joining us now to discuss self-driving tech expert Vasant Dar of NYU, our Bloomberg contributing editor David Kirkpatrick with me here in San Francisco today, and Max Chafkin who wrote this exclusive story for Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, Max, we're also learning that a judge has denied Uber's settlement with California drivers. This was that $100 million settlement in the three-year-old lawsuit over whether or not drivers should be treated as employees or independent contractors. And it looks like even though Uber uh, lost the settlement, it's actually good for Uber. Can you explain what this means? I mean, what it means is that Uber is is locked in this kind of ongoing discussion over what its drivers are. Are they employees? Are they um, independent contractors, sort of small businessmen uh, or women? And um, basically, what this settlement means is this this conversation is going to keep going. Which, which to be honest, even if the settlement had gone through, there would have been more more issues, more court things, more lawsuits, etc. So it's not like a huge bit of news, but it just does show like that this is a problem that. Uber is going to face for for some time. But how does it give Uber the upper hand? So I, I suppose it gives Uber the upper hand because what happened in San Francisco was there the, a judge wanted uh, wanted Uber's drivers to be able to get out of arbitration, um, and he was saying he would not approve the settlement without this clause that would have allowed them to get out of arbitration. Uber said, no, we're going to walk away from the deal if you do that, and now that's what's happening. So it means that they won't have been forced to get into arbitration situations. All right. Well, uh, fascinating story that you broke earlier today about Uber's push into self-driving cars that uh, people in Pittsburgh will be able to ride in a self-driving Uber Volvo this month. Tell us the details. Well, and, and just to just to add to something you started at the top, uh, the acquisition of Auto, we actually do have a pretty good idea of the price. It was uh, 680 million uh, thereabouts. So it's one of the biggest deals in the space. In Pittsburgh, Uber will be sort of launching this pilot program, you know, right now in the next couple of weeks, where drivers at random or uh, riders at random will be able to sort of experience this this new era. And we should be clear that people will be experiencing it with a test driver and also with kind of a, a co-pilot, just a guy sitting there taking notes. Um, uh, so it's very, very early, um, but it's exciting. And I, I wrote in one of these a uh, couple weeks back, and, you know, I can tell you that um, it's an experience. <laughs> I rode in Google self-driving car four years ago, but the technology has improved so much since then. David Kirkpatrick, you were on the show when we interviewed Leo Ron, who's the founder of Auto, this self-driving truck company. What's your take on all this? Well, first of all, it's stunning that they're going to really be deploying self-driving mm -hmm. tech, it's Ubers in, in, in Pittsburgh so soon. I, I'm really impressed by that, although I'm not sure I would want to be one of the people to ride in them. I'm glad two people be in the front seat. Um, it's interesting, you know, Uber has put all this money into its P Pittsburgh labs where they hired all these people away from Carnegie Mellon. It kind of feels to me like they may be disappointed with the outcome of that and that's why they felt they had to buy Auto with all of its Google expertise that sort of it took away into, into Auto. I, I think it, it looks like from the way they're describing it that Auto will be sort of the center of gravity of Uber's self-driving technology efforts, which might be a negative for those people that are all the way in Pittsburgh. Maybe they're salvaging their, you know, self-respect by deploying cars in their hometown. I don't know. Uh, Vasant, you specifically researched decision decision making uh, by humans versus machines. Are we really ready to let robots take the wheel? And are robots really ready for the challenge? <laughs> Emily, uh, you know, this is really all about trust. 
it's all about establishing trust. And, you know, I've written about this extensively, namely, when should we trust machines with decisions? And uh, this is really a bold move by Uber because what they're really doing is they're going out of sort of the simulation mode and, uh, you know, putting this out there in into the real world. Uh, and that's the only way really to establish trust, trust with uh, consumers and even more importantly, trust with regulators uh, who really need to be convinced <coughs> that this thing works and uh, it's better for society and it doesn't impose huge risks on individuals. And there's only one way to do it, which is to put it out there. And this is absolutely brilliant uh, because it puts them in a position where they're gathering uh, really valuable data that others don't have. So it gives them sort of that first mover advantage of uh, gathering data from vehicles operating in the real world. Um, and that's different. Uh, and they need to do that in order to establish trust, uh, which so is Max, key to these kinds of systems. Max, how will this actually work? Do users opt in? to wanting to be picked up by a self-driving car, or does one just show up? As I understand it, you, you, you opt in, and then you just sort of use the platform normally, and it's like being caller number 100 or whatever on the radio station. You, you just get a little alert that says, oh, by the way, you're, you're going to be in a self-driving car. Uh, hope you don't have a lot of luggage, because these self-driving cars have giant uh, computers in the trunk. So uh, th there's some sort of practical considerations as well. The passenger number is limited, of course, because of the driver and the co-pilot. You know, one thing that's really interesting about this, um, this Uber uh, self-driving thing is is the data angle, which is that Uber has driven many hundreds of millions, I guess billions of miles. Um, and so what they're saying is that they may be able to use the data that their human drivers are collecting to sort of train the robots, which is kind of an exciting thing for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who are who are deep in the space. Yeah, and that's key, by the way, uh, you know, because in the real world, you, you get these things called edge cases that people in AI refer to as edge cases. Other people refer to them as... Uh, maybe Rumsfeldian unknowns. Uh, so, you know, you just have to have these machines experience as much of that as possible, and that's only uh, possible when they drive in the real world. Um, the other thing, by the way, that hasn't really been talked about is that this is really sort of Uber getting back into China in a, in a way, uh, you know, because uh, Volvo is really owned by Geely, uh, and so this is uh, sort of an indirect way of getting back into the uh, Chinese scene, so to speak. Interesting point there, this on the back of them selling their China business to their biggest rival in China, DD. Uh, David, you know, what about the people like you and me who may not opt into this right away, who are on the road and didn't choose to be driving next to a self-driving Uber Volvo? Well, that's related to the question that was been running through my head, which is they better hope that nothing goes wrong here yeah. because you know it reminds me you know first of all Tesla was claiming that they had more data about self-driving because they have all these cars on the road so maybe this is Uber's way to jumpstart them but then look at what happened when Tesla had one accident that was probably quite predictable but these very overly I would say overly valued companies whether they're public or private they almost have this extraordinary pressure to prove that they can do right. these things. And that means they're in a very perilous position if they go wrong. And I, I think it's pretty dicey to be doing this so early. I mean, from everything I hear, they're not going to get those two people out of the front seat anytime soon. And if they did, they might be inviting disaster. Right. And accidents will happen, if rarely. Um, obviously, we'll continue to follow this. will be interesting to watch. Uh, competitors like Tesla and Google, what their next move will be. Um, David Kirkpatrick, our Bloomberg contributing editor, you are sticking with me. Vasant Dar of NYU, thank you. And Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin, who wrote this story. It is a great read. Check it out in Business Week. Staying now with Uber, Techstars co-founder David Cohen was one of the company's earliest backers, an angel investor before the company even had any cars on the road. Bloomberg's Carolyn Hyde sat down with Cohen in Berlin and asked what he was thinking when he bet on the company way back then. It was not a hot deal when I invested in it. Um, you know, Ryan Graves, who I met early on as a first employee, was mentoring at Techstars, and it wasn't hard to get into. They didn't have any cars on the road. It was just an idea, uh, right, like any other. But you're excited, again, by the people and the vision that they have. Didn't seem any better than any other of, of the many investments I've made the day that I made it. So just, you know, fortunate to be involved. You can catch the full interview with Techstars co-founder, David Cohen, tomorrow on Bloomberg West. Up next, Apple's next step for the watch hits a snag. We'll dig into what's holding up the latest developments ahead of the company's major product event next month. This is Bloomberg.
One stock to watch, Samsung, now at an all-time high, fueled by the success of its latest flagship Galaxy phone. Shares are up 30% this year, outpacing Apple's roughly 4% gain. Samsung's second quarter profit exceeded projections and defied industry-wide concerns about global smartphone demand and the rising competition from Chinese rivals. And we'll hear from one of those rivals tomorrow. Xiaomi's vice president of global operations, Hugo Bauer, will join us exclusively to talk about declining smartphone sales in China and the company's global expansion strategy. Well, Apple is hitting some snags in severing its watch from the iPhone, according to people with knowledge of the matter. Currently, in order for the Apple Watch to work, you need to have your iPhone close by, and that won't change with the new updates. The company still plans to announce new models this fall with improvements to health tracking, but they won't be able to connect independently to cellular networks. Joining me now to discuss Ben Baharin, creative strategies analyst, my co-host David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, and Mark Gurman, who broke this story for Bloomberg News. Mark, yet again, another scoop. What do we know? Well, like you said, we know that this Apple Watch is not going to be able to connect to networks from AT&T, Verizon, etc., and internationally. Apple had a plan to come out with a new version this year that could connect to cellular networks. So that would mean you can get sports scores, download um, text messages, email, mapping data with leaving your phone behind. They hit some snags related to engineering, related to the battery life. The cellular chips of today's age uh, consume way too much power for an Apple Watch, this very small size watch. So the trade-off was too large to have that in there because the battery would drain way too quickly for the users. Ben, you've been following the watch really closely. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not shocking. I mean, one of the things that we've sort of been looking at is, you know, what's the modem technology going to be behind with this? I mean, we had been hearing that Apple's working on their own sort of modem technology. And again, the, 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 the computer on the watch is one full SOC. So essentially, they would need to design the modem onto that, which they can't really do that with Qualcomm's mm -hmm. or, or Intel. So it kind of, kind of had to be their own. And I had been hearing that that was delayed for some of the reasons that, you know, Mark said, but just not on the same track. So I was not shocked by that. Um, I, I'm again, I'm not sure, like we see with existing watch owners, we have research data that suggests that they want that feature. I'm not sure that a normal new person wants that feature. So I think it's a real question, like where's the value in it? Is it a necessity? You know, like what Mark was saying, GPS, I think, you know, makes a lot of sense to be in the product and others. But the modem, I'm just, again, I'm not sure. I think it would be a nice, a nice feature, but I'm not sure that's like why somebody would go out and buy it who didn't have one yet. So I think there's still potential for the market to grow. And will the new watches be unveiled? at the September 7th event? Uh, we know that there will be a new watch unveiled this fall mm. um, without the cellular. The cellular won't be announced so nor shipped this year. So what will be new about them? New health tracking features, mm -hmm. so big advancements there, and partly that will be because of a new GPS chip. So GPS right now is in the iPhone. And if you want the most accurate data for running and walking with the activity app on the Apple Watch, you have to either calibrate for a 20 minute process or bring the phone with you. Now the GPS will be built into the watch, so you don't have to worry about that. You'll have to get consistently accurate data with every workout. So Ben, what do we know about how the watch is actually selling? I mean, I know you've been trying to track this and you've had actually more um, positive yeah. analysis than, than some others. How are the watches selling and will people buy yeah. new ones? I mean, I think it's interesting because because they're waiting to the fall, right, to update this product. It's been on the market for over a year versus if they'd have done some refresh in the spring, I think we could have seen more optimistic sales going into momentum of this year. But it's clearly a holiday buying cycle. I mean, I think if you just look back at, at this category in general, but particularly like watches and what Apple Watch did last Q4, I mean, clearly it's a holiday product. So it makes sense to do that refresh. But for me, I mean, again, this is all about can they grow sales to new customers because obviously there's a lot of techies and early adopters who got into the market bought but can they bring it to like normal people right and i think that's the question so that'll be what price points do they get to what models do they keep in market which ones do they recycle which do they up fresh do they do much on design i mean these mm -hmm. these are the things but you know again we, we still see most of this being a fitness and health market we're not seeing large sales for this go outside of either tech or fitness and health i'd like to see it expand into some other use cases but that's again where the new software more developers writing apps might expand it. Um, but we still think there's a lot of headroom. I mean, again, we think there's a lot of headroom in this market. And I think there's an evolution for watches. I, I just think it's going slower than we thought. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's the big question. Just w w what's the size of the market and maybe what the, the cadence and sales overall might be from a volume standpoint. David? Well, you know, I always thought Apple overplayed the fashion part of the watch. Mm -hmm. And I actually think one of the reasons there isn't that much demand from non-techies is they haven't really explained very well what is kind of cool about it. And I have one and I like it. I, I like the alarms. I like um, uh, getting my messages on 
I was at a dinner last night that I was hosting, you know, very busy, and somebody was unhappy somewhere in the room, and I got a, a text message on my watch, and it really helped me do it my job in a way that I couldn't have otherwise, because there's no way I would have pulled my phone out knowing that I had a message at that moment. So I think there's real benefits to the watch that are un under not understood. I also think the price is critical. I didn't buy mine until it got to 300. It just seemed to me more than was worth up until that point, and that was still borderline. But the, the interesting thing about the, wa the battery, I just want to quickly say, is this is the thing that's holding back this entire industry. Um, in the, one of the reasons it's a problem with the watch, and you guys are more expert at this than me, but it's because they have a fairly big screen. There are watches out there that connect to cell phone networks perfectly fine. They just don't have as many other features. Mm. Um, so it's Apple's desire to have it all at a time when battery technology is not moving forward right. quickly enough. And I, we talked about this on the air not long ago with Mark that, you know, it's the one thing that I keep finding disappointing about Apple and even his predictions of what the next iPhone is going to be. It's not going to really have dramatic improvements in battery life, which is the one feature that people really want. Right, but battery technology hasn't improved significantly in a century. But I there mean, are technologies to improve it. Like, I went to the launch of this new uh, Huawei Honor phone the other day. They have amazing technologies built into their phone to extend the battery life and to help you manage the battery that I think will give some phones an advantage. Now, maybe Apple will incorporate that kind of stuff, too, but it's desperately needed. Quick thought. Well, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. That, on the watch side, it's positive. We continue to see existing customer satisfaction be high, which you know is what Tim Cook likes mm -hmm. to measure the success of products on. That, that hasn't changed. We've seen that stay high. So I think that's positive. Um, you know, the battery and design stuff, I mean, we're in, we're in a, a different cycle in this industry. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I think that for us is just kind of the key things to keep observing. Okay, Ben Baharin of Creative Strategies, Mark Gurman, as always, thank you. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, thank Good you to be all here in person. for joining us. Yes, you. see you in the flesh. More of Bloomberg West next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of advanced micro devices surged in Thursday trading after unveiling a refreshed product lineup aimed at cracking Intel's dominance in the chip market. AMD has been struggling to regain lost market share from rival Intel. Our editor at large, Corey Johnson, sat down with AMD CEO Lisa Su to find out how the company plans to reverse the trend. 
You know, I think the way to think about it is, you know, Zen is a foundation for high performance computing. Um, we're very pleased with where it is. I think the key for us has been to hit our goals and we're right on track with where we expect it to be. Uh, we have some more work to do before we go out into full production, but I would say uh, from our standpoint and from our customers, we're really pleased with where we are. There's a notion that we've hit peak PC, that PCs will never sell as well as they did about three or four years ago. Here you are entering into a market that, as you mentioned, will have many out outputs, but whether it's in servers or in PCs. But how do you see the PC market that is shrinking, not growing? You know, I think the key thing to think about is what, what pieces of the market are growing. And again, if you look at high performance gaming, you know, PC gaming, game consoles, uh, virtual reality, uh, you know, anything that requires a lot of computing horsepower, those are areas that are growing and they're actually quite profitable. So we believe we've targeted our products to the segments of the market that are, you know, both growing and highly profitable. And as you look out, you know, you mentioned the products drops early next year. You surely are already planning for subsequent versions of it. How? What do you expect the cycles to be for upgrades of this um, going forward? Is that going to we're going to kind of remain on what was traditionally an 18 to 24 month uh, time frame, or we're going to do something uh, more aggressive? You know, I think it depends on the market. Um, I would say the PC market tends to move a little bit faster, so you might see something on a 12 month cycle. Um, I think the server market, you know, 18 to 24 months is reasonable. Um, I think for us, the key is you know Zen gives us an incredible foundation to build on top of, and we've already already worked on you know, not just Zen, but the next generation uh, to come on top of that to ensure for our customers that we have a long-term roadmap that uh, satisfies their, their needs. And it sounds like you're focused on the heavy processing that happens at servers and in PCs and in games and not mobile and not other markets that are evolving to be bigger markets. You know, I think it's fair to say that for where, um, where we are in terms of size, we need to pick the places that we believe um, are the highest growth segments. So, you know, in terms of high performance computing, both on the graphics side and on the CPU side, we think it's a huge market. It's a $60 billion TAM, so there's more than enough areas for us to grow. Um, it is true we're not in mobile, and I think that's totally okay. Our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, with Lisa Sue, CEO of AMD. A stock we are watching, the gene sequencing equipment maker Illumina spiked as much as 8% on a report that Thermo Fisher Scientific wants to buy the company for $30 billion. According to StreetInsider.com, this latest bid is an all-stock offer and would be $4 billion higher than Illumina's current market cap. Four years ago, the company rejected takeover attempts by Roche and one offer valued at nearly $7 billion. Thermo Fisher has spent more than $16 billion over the last two years on companies with technology to decode DNA. And a story we've been following, the final chapter for online media pioneer Gawker. Founder Nick Denton told staff that Gawker's flagship site will shut down next week. Earlier this week, Univision won a $135 million bid to acquire Gawker Media, which includes Gawker.com, Deadspin, Jezebel, among others. Denton also confirmed he won't be working for Univision and will instead move on to other projects. Gawker was driven into bankruptcy after losing an invasion of privacy suit to Hulk Hogan. We'll be back with more of Bloomberg West and Series A next.
I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg West. Let's get a check of your first word news. A new Pew Research Center survey shows Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton leading Republican nominee Donald Trump by four points nationally. The poll of registered voters has Clinton with 41 percent, Trump with 37 percent. Libertarian Gary Johnson has 10 percent and the Green Party's Jill Stein has 4 percent. The poll has a margin of error of 2.8 points. Next month, President Obama becomes the first U.S. Commander-in-Chief to visit Laos. The White House says the president will make what's expected to be his last official trip to Asia beginning September 2nd. He'll participate in the G20 summit in China, meet privately with President Xi Jinping, and attend a pair of regional conferences while in Laos. Chicago's police superintendent plans to recommend firing seven officers accused of filing false police reports in the 2014 death of Laquan McDonald, the black teen who was shot 16 times at close range. Jason Van Dyke, the officer who shot McDonald, has pleaded not guilty to a charge of first-degree murder. Suspended Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff says she made two mistakes while in office. One was a political error in choosing current acting President Michel Temer as her vice president. She says the other was imposing tax cuts, which didn't work as expected. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 6.30 p.m. Thursday here in New York, 8.30 Friday morning in Sydney. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Looks like a flat end to the week. Uh, the NZX has been trading for 30 minutes, and that's looking flat. Uh, Nikkei and ASX futures also trading pretty flat as well. We'll be keeping an eye on Australia's big four banks at the open here. Uh, that's after Moody's reaffirmed the AA2 rating for all four banks. However, it's revised their outlook to negative, saying a challenging environment could lead to deterioration of profit growth and asset quality. Energy stocks are going to be in focus in Australia today as well. Uh, Woodside's just reported first half earnings, a uh, net profit of $340 million. Revenues, however, down 24%. Uh, Santos also due to announce a first half profit. We're expecting a $20 million loss there. And on Monday, Santos announced a $1 billion write-down to its Gladstone LNG uh, project. Uh, weak energy prices, of course, are weighing on both those stocks. Also, one rate decision out today. Uh, look out for Indonesia, likely to cut the cash rate there from 20 25 basis points to 5%. Inflation in Indonesia, 3.21%, getting down towards the bottom of the target range. I'm Paul Allen for Bloomberg TV in Sydney, Australia. This is Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. It is time for Series A, our weekly roundtable on investing. And this week, we're focused on funding disruption across the media industry. We've already seen now established players like Netflix and Amazon Studios bring TV into the on demand era. Now, the up and coming Hollywood studio STX Entertainment wants in. STX is known for movies like The Gift and the recently released Bad Moms, but recently raised new funds to expand into TV, digital, video games, and virtual reality. They're being backed by big Chinese investors like Tencent. It's no easy task to start a multimedia company from scratch, so will STX succeed where others have failed? Joining me now to discuss STX Entertainment CEO Bob Simons, as well as TPG Growth Fund founder Bill McGlashan, who co-founded STX alongside Bob and has been incubating the company since. It's a really interesting partnership that you guys have. First of all, can you explain how it works? Sure. Well, I'll take this one. Please. <laughs> When Bill and I first came up with the idea for this, we realized that if you were going to build an entertainment company today, it's not going to look like the entertainment companies that exist right now look. Mm -hmm. Their business models are 100 years old, and a lot of things they've done have basically been to bolt on different revenue streams. So we said, if we're going to build a company today, A, it's going to look very different, and B, China is going to be an integral part of the DNA. We weren't going to actually try to build a company that um, tried to push its product into China. China, we instead were going to try to um, uh, have it as sort of a bridge where, where it was like literally part of the DNA. So you guys have gotten a lot of attention for saying you're doing things differently. How are you doing things differently from traditional studios? I can take that one. Yeah, please. The main thing has to do with the, the product mix. Um, the main, the, the six major studios have changed their films 
to being fewer but more expensive, lots of sequels, remakes, and franchise films, which is exactly what they should be doing. And they created this really interesting vacuum in the middle, this sort of 20 to $80 million price range where you have a star in a signature role. And we know that to be a very, very profitable area. So given the fact that we weren't burdened with legacy deals and weren't burdened with massive overhead, we were able to go after that space. And Bad Moms is a great example of right. what we hope to do over and over again. I cannot wait to see it. You know, is, is Bad Moms a good example of, you know, something you're doing differently? Or if not, you know, what are the movies that you think really exemplify this strategy? Yeah, so Bad Moms is actually exactly what we're trying to do. It's a $20 million film that should do about $200 million box office worldwide. It's uh, a number of very um, identifiable comedians in a comedy. It's, it's sort of these actresses the way you want to see them in an idea that we thought we could sell before we even greenlit it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different offshoots, TV um, and short form that we can do based on this property. So the, the other thing I'd add to that that's inherent in our model because of the way we're structured which isn't necessarily as obvious when you see a movie like Bad Moms is we built this company from the beginning with an eye to China mm -hmm. and to the other global markets. So China will within four years be the largest media market in the world. And we brought in, as you saw, as you said at the beginning here of this segment, the some of the most important Chinese partners. But from the very beginning, we had Chinese partners we brought in. And the whole notion here was to build content that was leverageable globally from the outset. Uh, with partners that could help inform on the China side what they were looking for uh, in media as well. Now, the entertainment opportunity in China is clear. Everybody wants their movies or TV shows to be shown in China, but there are a lot of challenges in, in dealing with the Chinese government and the things that they want their people to see. How do you navigate that balance uh, between making compromises to get your stuff into China and, you know, being true to the art? So first and foremost, the kinds of content that we're making, whether it's movies, TV, et cetera, it's designed for global audience. It's actually not designed explicitly for China. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make movies for the whole world. Um, as for being able to crack the Chinese market, you know, as Bill said, when we first, you know, TPG Growth incubated this company, it was literally just an idea that you know, two years later we sort of willed into being, three years later we sort of willed this into being, but one of the first people we went to was John Zhao at Honey Capital, mm -hmm. which is one of China's largest PE shops. He's been a spectacular partner in helping to us to navigate how things should work there. Oh, but plus I must say that TPG is also really successful. It's one of the, it's one of the most successful um, private equity firms in China. Um, but this is where companies like Tencent and PCCW come in. Mm -hmm. We also have a partnership with Huayi Brothers. So what we've tried to do is align ourselves with the best thinkers um, who can help teach us how to make it work there. So unlike a normal American company that is trying to sort of retroactively push their stuff in, we proactively try to align ourselves with people who understand the market. Mm -hmm. And that's what hopefully will give us an edge. So, Bill, you know, a lot of this new funding will be used towards new TV projects. What are the opportunities you see in TV when you've got Amazon and Netflix spending so much on original content? You've got people out there saying, we're in a TV bubble. You know, John Landgraf, uh, TV executive, saying we are ballooning into oversupply and that balloon will eventually deflate. I continue to believe there's greater supply of TV than can be produced profitably. So just like the movie business, there's obviously television content that wouldn't be profitable. And then if you produce the right television content, it obviously can be wildly profitable. What uh, Hulu, Amazon, Netflix um, are doing, the doubling in investment they've made between last year and this year in original content speaks to the fact that the way we consume TV is completely different. You know, when we grew up, it was a linear broadcasting modality. The only thing left that's linear is sports. People will actually you know, sign on to their television to watch a game, a sporting event. But the rest of content television is a different form of media and the lines have really blurred. You see artists that are A-list artists now doing television. An individual episode of Game of Thrones uh, at 10 to $12 million costs what a movie costs. Mm -hmm. And the quality of it is like that of a movie. You no longer have television as sort of the, the runt of the litter with Hollywood blockbusters being the high quality uh, form of the art. So the whole way it's consumed has changed. The availability of a billion new screens for 
consumption of that content with China and India having and, and other emerging markets having shown up uh, makes for a fascinating landscape to invest in television content. But again, it still has to be good content. So right. if you throw lousy production out there, it won't it won't uh, succeed. So Bob, what kind of TV do you want to do? What kind of TV do you want to do differently? So it's a great question because what is TV is, is really what we're grappling with. It used to be movies were 90 minutes. If you're telling a story and it's 90 minutes, it's probably going to be a movie. If you're going to tell a story and it's 22 minutes, it was probably going to be TV. Mm -hmm. But now you're going to do two minutes on Facebook or six seconds on Snapchat. Ultimately, if you can, what we're trying to do is essentially aggregate the world's best storytellers and biggest movie star brands who are all incredibly interested in trying to tell stories across all of these different platforms. Um, we're trying to create this sort of frictionless creative experience where they can tell their stories across all these different platforms and figure out kind of which is the best way to go. But where we are right now is all these lines are completely blurring. So the kinds of TV we're doing are just like our movies. They're star-driven stars in signature roles. But, um, but I think there's going to be a lot more overlapping and a lot more breaking down of those barriers than have been certainly in the last three or four years. All right, Bob Simon, CEO of STX, Bill McGlashan of TPG. We're going to continue this conversation after a quick break. Thank you both. Absolutely. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg West and our weekly investing roundtable Series A. Here with me still, STX Entertainment CEO Bob Simons and TPG Growth Fund founder Bill McGlashan. We've been discussing STX latest funding round. I, I want to talk a little bit more about your relationship because, you know, private equity normally stays in a company for a finite amount of time and then leaves. Is that going to be different this time? What are your intentions here? Well, it, it, it's different in the way this all began mm -hmm. because, um, we sat together uh, after being at a board meeting together. We sat together, uh, and Bob's been a friend of mine. We've known each other since college days uh, together, and we sat together and and you know realized a lot of what we've been talking about, which is the global landscape is so different that we could build a different kind of business together. And our first check uh, in this in this company was a million dollars, and people don't think of TPG as being willing to get in and help create a business. And we've been working as partners. Uh, all the way long to create this. So this is a company that uh, was a function of the 40 investments we've made in media businesses, the $4 billion of investment, mm -hmm. the, the, the notion behind that, and the fact that Bob has probably the best ROI 
of any uh, Hollywood producer. I mean, he's he's been a prolific producer of his career and has consistently generated. When well, he generates profits, he's got a respect for capital, which is obviously important as an investor that you're working with someone who sees the world that way. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a great marriage from the beginning, uh, and you know, there we ultimately have to return capital to our investors, but we tend to be fairly patient, and our goal is to maximize return at the end of the day. But also, I mean, kind of what you were getting at, which is really unusual for a PE shop, which is they don't incubate companies. This thing was literally, this was started as a simple idea between us that's now grown into a multi-billion dollar company mm -hmm. almost overnight. And what's amazing is that the way Bill and his team approached the risk reward profile of literally growing something and yet having the heft and power to actually allow us to dislocate a lot of very traditional majors is a combination that I just haven't seen out there. And Bill, STX is the only company I pay him for you that, by the way. founded. But <laughs> you've got quite a resume, Bill. Um, <laughs> you know, you've also got another company, uh, Evolution Media Partners. This is an investment firm that's focused on entertainment, tech, and a lot of different yep. uh, industries. You, you're an investor in Jaunt, mm -hmm. a virtual reality, for example, which obviously I know you know, STX has VR ambitions as well. Yeah. You know, what do you think is the potential for VR in mainstream entertainment? Yeah, I'll, I mean, Bob can talk about it as well here, but I, I, we've actually made four investments in what we think are some of the most interesting VR businesses, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's based on a lot of work that we've done thematically to understand how, again, consumers are engaging with media, and we believe in sports, music, uh, and media content, generally gaming, VR will be a ubiquitous way that we all engage because it's a meaningfully better experience. Right. But, it's remarkable. But when? When will I be able to enjoy a VR TV or movie experience comfortably? <laughs> so basically starting about now, I mean, look, at, at STX, we're not technology people. Mm. Um, we don't know who's going to win. Our whole goal is to essentially aggregate the best storytellers to figure out what the syntax is going to be in this space. Because remember, with VR, and VR is going to be huge, with VR, you don't control the frame. So it's very tough to tell a story and take somebody on an emotional journey when you can't actually manipulate that journey for them. Hmm. So it's going to be a completely different language to storytelling. And um, we're trying to throw some of the, the best minds at that. I mean, what's amazing is that the biggest stars, the biggest directors are all fascinated with trying to crack this space. And again, from our standpoint, we figure that as the different companies are all vying for dominance, um, they're all going to need content, mm -hmm. and they're all going to need compelling content, and we want to be the ones that provide that. The other, the other VR side of this is going to be simply uh, experiencing live events differently. Yeah. You're going to see you know, major bands allowing for their fans to have a VR experience that puts them on the stage. You're not going to necessarily have to spend what people spent to sit in the floor seats of the Warriors' final right. uh, NBA games. You'll have an experience that is virtually identical, if not better, than having those seats in the on very the, near term. On the note, do you think there is room in the future for the humble movie theater? Will we still go to the cinema? Will we watch it on our couch? Like that one? Well, first off, um, Personally, yes, I absolutely think the movie theater isn't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like going back to the caveman, sitting around fires telling stories. It's like you want that communal experience. Mm -hmm. So sitting in a, in a dark room with a bunch of people laughing or being scared or being adrenalized, I mean, that's a pretty awesome experience that I don't think is going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's going to be different types of stories you tell to achieve that goal. So, um, you know, being able to watch something on TV uh, or in the in the in your own living room or even on a mobile phone. I mean, you know, it's really interesting that both demographically and culturally people access stories differently. So in China, um, it's actually very normal to watch a 90 minute movie on your phone. Uh, same thing in India. Mm -hmm. That's not normal for us yet. Um, but as I say, it's going to all start to bleed right. and, and what we're hoping is that as it bleeds, the demand for quality content is going to continue to increase. Talking about cable, in other news, you announced this week TPG acquiring RCN and Grande Communications. How do you see consolidation playing out across cable? Well, cable, our, our bet in putting the two together, we, we create RCN and Grande created a top 10 uh, cable uh, platform. Obviously, we're very excited about the, the company and the teams uh, there. Uh, but we fundamentally believe that uh, cable represents the 21st century utility. 
uh, everything we've been talking about, the way people consume content, the ubiquity of content, all the exciting new developments that are taking place and the way we're all consuming them need that kind of infrastructure to allow it to exist. So it's no different than the infrastructure that was put into water distribution, mm -hmm. basic utilities. Nowadays, this is fundamental. So what it means is these businesses are going to be quite doing quite well, in our view, going forward mm -hmm. uh, as they realize the macro benefit uh, driving that consumption pattern. Bob, do content creators need to keep one foot in distribution to make their models work? That's our model. Mm -hmm. I mean, other people will disagree. Uh, there's a lot of different points of view on that from ours. We're absolutely convinced that being able to, if you're a great storyteller or you have a big brand as a star, being able to control and be involved with the content from inception all the way to delivery is the key. You're never handing it off. And for us, yeah, distribution is essentially the way you go. And look, from our standpoint, it's how you create uh, enterprise value. You know, it's a studio it, instead of a production company. Right. And, right. That, and that was from the very, very beginning what we wanted to do. Normally, when you make a, a piece of content, a movie, TV show, it makes money, it doesn't make money, and you capture that margin. Um, what we're trying to build is a company with enterprise value which is a very, very different uh, thing. It hasn't actually been done in right. Hollywood in quite some time. Okay. It's basically been a generation since a new studio yeah. of our scale has been created. Well, we are watching Bob Simons, STX CEO, Bill McGlashan of TPG. We're going to get some quick thoughts from you, closing thoughts after this quick break. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg West and our weekly investing roundtable Series A. Here with me still, STX Entertainment CEO Bob Simons and TPG Growth Fund founder Bill McGlashan. Got to talk to you about some of your other investments, of course, Uber and Spotify. We'll start with Spotify. Um, when are they going to go public? Wow, that's not an answer I can give you. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. <laughs> but really, you know, obviously there is so much competition when it comes to music streaming. Apple is saying that they're going to completely revamp their yep. uh, service. How do you see Spotify's place in this super competitive landscape? Yeah, well, I mean, we obviously are big believers in Spotify. Evidence our our recent investment that we and TPG Growth and our, our credit team, TSL, and, and, uh, and um, uh, Dragoneer led. Um, we 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 believe that there is a place for a business like Spotify in the future of music. And if you look at the data, over 30 million subscribers at Spotify today. Uh, last year, we streamed 20 billion hours of music. Um, so you've had just as we discussed how the consumption habits of content, media content, have changed. Music 
is similar. It, my children could never, my oldest 15 and 13 and, 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 and 11, couldn't imagine buying music. You know, they, they stream everything. And that's just the, the consumption pattern that now exists. And it's a delightful user experience. So there's no point in stealing music anymore mm -hmm. because they provide a curation and a model of exploring music that's that's delightful to the customer. Right. So I think the, first of all, the music industry itself is in a very interesting place where it's becoming more compelling. Um, and I think Spotify uh, is, is, is and will be a leading player in that. Spotify also getting into video content. I know you know you guys are tracking Spotify as well, Bob. What do you sure. Think? I mean, well, I think it originally started as Spot and Identify, which was video, mm -hmm. and I think they just went after music first because it was an easier market to crack. But they touch so many people and so many consumers. Um, there's a gigantic opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Last question about Uber. Are you guys uh, interested in calling an Uber? self-driving Volvo SUV, would you get in that thing? You guys are investors, I, you're I'm, on the board. Well, no, I, I am a, I'm a huge believer in that trend and the fact that it's, an, it, I think it's inevitable. I think mm -hmm. you'll see it happen in commercial shipping and transportation first. Would you do it this month? But if it, They're available this month. Yeah, w w uh, <laughs> as soon as it's ready, I'd love to, I'd love to do it. I think it's fascinating. Bob? Look, I'd like to try it too. I mean, I took an Uber from the airport to TPG and from TPG to With here. With a human driver. <laughs> With a human driver. With a human driver. Human drivers on both. But yes, um, I, I, it feels like that's the way the world is going to go, and they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for doing thank this. You. Really thank enjoyed you, this conversation. Uh, Bill McGlashan of TPG, founder of the Growth Fund, Bob Simons of STX Entertainment. Excited to see what you guys do together and see bad moms. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg West. Tomorrow, do not miss our conversation with John Maida, former design partner at Kleiner Perkins, head of the Rhode Island School of Design. He's moving on to a tech company, and he will tell us about his next adventure. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.
studios in New York City. This is